John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is and was and is coming, and from the seven spirits that are before God's throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To the one who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, who made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and always. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, including those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. This is so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and was and is coming, the Almighty. It comes from the book of Acts, the fifth chapter, beginning with the 27th verse, and I'm reading from the Common English Bible. The apostles were brought before the council where the high priest confronted them. In no uncertain terms, we demanded that you not teach in this name. And look at you. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you are determined to hold us responsible for this man's death. Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than humans. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God has exalted Jesus to his right side as leader and savior so that he could enable Israel to change its heart and life and to find forgiveness for sins. We are witnesses of such things, as is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Bishop William Williman tells the following story about his days at Duke University. On September 11th, the Duke campus ministers met to decide how to respond to the deep pastoral needs of students on that fateful day. We decided to offer prayer for any who wanted to talk to God or who were willing to listen to God every day at noon in our chapel. A dozen or so showed up for the first couple days to sit in a circle and pray, led by one of the campus ministers. As Providence would have it, on the Friday of that fateful week, President Bush declared a day for the whole nation to pray. But the campus minister who was to lead the service at Duke that Friday at noon was the only person in the country who did not get the message that the president had ordered a day of prayer. Perhaps because this particular campus minister is a Bible-thumping evangelical who listens more to scripture than to government press releases. At any rate, he showed up in the chapel expecting the usual dozen or so faithful only to encounter a couple of thousand folk ready to do what the president ordered. So, this Bible-believing, conservative, evangelical, virtually fundamentalist campus minister simply went on as usual, saying, let us pray. He then led the assembly in a quarter of an hour's confession of sin. He asked God to forgive us for our arrogance, our insensitivity to the needs of others, our trust in national weaponry more than God's power, and so on. That afternoon, my emails let me know that this was not the sort of chat with God that the congregation had in mind. People were mad. Many of the emails complained, we came there hurting, grieving, and we got all this talk about sin. And others said, we're victims, not sinners. Now, I was a pastor that day that time period and that story makes me mad because if you remember correctly our churches were filled after September 11th 
People came flocking back to the church looking for help with their anger, with their grief, with their fear, with all sorts of things. And somehow we didn't respond well. And within a month, most of those people were gone again. Church leaders are always saying, we want to pack the pews. We want to fill the churches. Well, due to a national tragedy, the pews were packed, but we didn't know what to say. And obviously that minister didn't know what to say either. And yet, as I'm reading through this story, getting as mad as I think Bishop Williman was at the events and, and the emails he was getting, agreeing with the emails, I came to that last one, we're not sinners, we're victims, and I went, whoa. You see, I have spent the last two months leading a class on the seven deadly sins. Plus, I was reading this story just about Holy Week. And if there is one thing that we as Christians do together during the season of Lent, and especially during Holy Week, it's to confess our sin. It's to confess the sin that we are the ones that crucified Christ. We find it all the time in our litany and liturgy and in our hymns. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me who him to death pursued? This is the way the church works and moves. Now, any of you alive when Jesus was crucified? participate in that act and yet there we are during the season of Lent and during Holy Week claiming that it was me each and every one of us claim it was me that killed him that sent him to that cross and so between the class and between the time of year I had to sit there and say hmm yeah, we were victimized. Our nation, the world, in fact, was victimized by that act of terrorism. And we are still being victimized by acts of terrorism. But that statement, we're not sinners, I'm not so sure. You see, what I've learned in this class I led, and thank you to all of you who attended, what we learn together is that deadly sin, the truly deadly sins, have to do with relationship. The deadly sins are not the same as the Ten Commandments. They are not about murder or rape or infidelity or stealing or lying or anything like that. The deadly sins have to do with whether or not we are in relationship with each other and with God. Are we so self-centered we're greedy? Do we care so little about others that we're lustful? I mean, the list goes on and on, week after week, every sin we studied, every sin that crushes our soul and kills it is a sin of lack of relationship. And so I pondered, had we really built the relationships we needed to that might have prevented others from sinning? But I had other things to do and to think about besides that. And I went on with Holy Week and I went on with um, get preparing for this weekend. And the very first scripture lesson for today, we lose the Old Testament lesson, by the way, during the Easter season. It's replaced with the book of Acts. And so the very first lesson in place of the Old Testament lesson that I read was today's scripture from the book of Acts. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Acts, you know what's happening in the storyline. Peter and some of the apostles have been out preaching and teaching. Pentecost has happened. Thousands are being converted. They're being told about Jesus' death and his resurrection. They are repenting of their sins. They're being baptized by water and the Holy Spirit. And Peter and the apostles are out there trying to change the world. But the temple officials are quite upset about this. 
They've done their best to get rid of Jesus, and now they've got this group of his followers to contend with. And so they arrest Peter and the others, and they imprison them. Now, the problem is, God didn't quite agree with that and sent an angel and let them out. And so here they are, back preaching in the temple. And uh, so the temple officials get really disgusted and unhappy with this situation, and they send the guards, go get them and bring them back. What are they doing out there? Who let them out? And so that's where we are. And the apostles have been brought back before the leaders who have already scolded them and thrown them into prison. And they are not happy, these temple officials. And so they confront the apostles and say, in no uncertain terms, we demanded that you not teach in this name. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to hold us responsible for this man's death. And suddenly I heard it again. We're not sinners, we're victims. We were only trying to do the best for our people. That Jesus was a troublemaker and we had to get rid of him to protect our people. We were really only thinking about you. We are not the sinners here. We are the victims, victims of this guy. Victims of you who keep telling us that we killed him. No, 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 we were protecting our people. We weren't sinning. And I ran right into it again. And so I had to contemplate, what is the role of sin? And why are we reading about it on this Sunday after Easter? Shouldn't we all be celebrating? Shouldn't we all be out there proclaiming the resurrection? And yet, even Peter talks about sin as he responds to them. He explains that the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. Yeah, he's not going to let that go, is he? You killed. And now God has exalted Jesus as a leader and as a savior. And listen to this. So he could enable Israel to change its heart and life and to find forgiveness of sins. You see, the cross... The cross of Holy Week is intimately connected to that empty tomb and the resurrection of Easter. And even for Peter, it is so important for people to understand their sin, their complacency, their role in the death of Jesus. Because until you confess your sin, you cannot have the new life that Easter offers. And so I thought about that. I thought about the role of that cross and its connection to the resurrection of Easter. And I thought about the prayer of confession that we pray. Have you ever paid any attention to it? We usually pray it on communion Sundays, a corporate prayer of confession. And it is not a prayer of confession that is centered on, oh God, forgive me, I lied this week. Or God, forgive me because I was angry this week. No, it's about those relationships all over again. As we come before God as a body together, the body of Christ, and we proclaim, merciful God, we confess. And listen to what we confess. We've not loved you with a whole heart. We failed to be an obedient church. We've not done your will. We've broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. We've not loved our neighbor, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. All those sins are sins of brokenness, of brokenness of relationship. All those sins say that we haven't quite got it together yet. All those sins are deadly sins. And we sit here and we proclaim this, and half the time we don't even bother listening to what we're saying. But this is important. 
It was an important enough thing for Peter to keep poking at those leaders in the Jewish temple saying, you have to understand, you killed him. You have to understand, you've made mistakes. And you have to confess that sin because Christ came and he hung on a cross and he died there so that we could know that we're forgiven. We could know we're forgiven. Even us, here and now, we sit here and we, we think that we've somehow done a better job because we're here. But what this prayer of confession says is that, no, we're still making mistakes and we're still getting it wrong. But we just know the way to travel to make things better, to get back into right relationship with God and with each other. But this church does not protect us from sin. Those doors do not protect us from sin within our own hearts and within the hearts of others. One of the most touching songs I ever heard, a friend of mine did it as a solo in a church I was in, and it's called In the Shadow of the Cross. Anyone you ever heard of it before? And it talks about how the church is gathered inside and praying and singing and worshiping God. But in the shadow of the cross, people are hurting. People are crying. People are dying outside those doors. That's why we have to confess our sin. We don't confess our sin because we're here. We're here because we understand that we need to confess our sin. Because out there, there are people who are hurting. Out there, there are people in pain. Out there, there are people who don't know that hope is possible, that forgiveness is possible. And so we are in here to learn, to become, as Peter tells us, witnesses. Witnesses to what happened to Christ and what happens to us as a result of what happened to Christ. You see, Peter's whole sermon is Holy Week all over again as he moves from the forgiveness of sins enabled by the death of Jesus Christ to the fact that we are witnesses of not only the death of Jesus Christ but the resurrection and the new life. Of Jesus Christ. You see, after we say that prayer of confession, there's always an absolution. And the priest always stands up and says that, hear the good news. See, we've confessed our sins, but it's not to make us feel bad. It's because we need to confess our sins so we can truly hear and understand the power of the good news. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. See, it doesn't matter if we're perfect or not yet. It doesn't matter if we do everything right or not. What matters is that we understand our failings and we're trying to overcome them by being in relationship with God and with each other. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. It proves it. And then, and then we proclaim, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And then all of us together respond because we understand none of us gets it right all the time. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. I need that forgiveness. You need that forgiveness. But once we are forgiven, once we've heard the good news, then we are the witnesses that are to go forth and proclaim it to the world. This is the power of the Easter message. It is not just about that day that the tomb was found empty. No, the power of the message is the day that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And now we can have new life because of that cross and because of that empty tomb. And we are witnesses to these things, as Peter tells us. And we need to be out there finding those people beyond our doors and telling them the power of this story, telling them that there is hope, telling them that there is joy, telling them that there is new life if they are just willing to face the fact that none of us gets it right all the time. Merciful God, we confess. 
They are some of the most powerful words that we have to say together in the church. When we are hurting, when we are feeling guilty or ashamed, when we are wondering about the future, merciful God, we confess we are here and we don't always know why. But merciful God, we confess that we are trying and we want to know more. And we want to be your witnesses. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. But then God raised him from the dead that we might all know new life. That we all might know the hope of resurrection. Oh, it is a powerful story. It starts in despair, but it ends in glory. And so does that absolution as we all finish up. Glory to God. Amen. And so let us become God's witnesses and remember, merciful God, we confess, but there is good news, and we sing your praise and glory. Amen.